Hi, everybody. My name is Jen Chan. I'm the marketing director for Fantagraphics Books. Thanks for tuning in and welcome to the debut of our new video author series. I'm really excited to have with me today Katie Skelly. You guys know her for her books, The Agency and My Pretty Vampire. And today we're going to talk about her newest book, called Maids, which is going to be published in October 2020. So Katie, thanks for, thanks for being here. It's really yeah. great. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to talk about Killer Maids. Yes, yes, Killer Maids. <laughs> yeah, congratulations on the book. Um, it's you. really great. I was able to read an advanced reading copy oh, cool. and it's really great. I myself, I, I really love um, crime noir and, and mysteries. So this was totally up my alley. Oh, and, that's awesome. um, Thank you. Yeah, and for me, like I, as a reader, um, it was especially um, exciting um, to read something true crime because you know, because as you're reading it, you just, you know that it's true. It's based on true events. Mm -hmm. um, and so for, with this book and also My Pretty, My Pretty Val uh, Vampire, um, which is a horror book. Um, what, my first question for you is um, what, uh, sorry, what attracts you to, what attracts you to um, the horror and, uh, and true crime genres? I think that horror is something that I use to kind of deal with my own um, sort of anxieties, I would say. Um, I've always been really attracted to horror. It's always been a really important part of my life, like for better or for worse. Um, when I'm going through kind of like a tough time, that's when I'll really like lean into horror and really dig into it um, because I think it just throws everything into relief. Like, oh, it's not so bad. Like, you know, at least I'm not in like a dance school for witches, you know, like things are really working out okay for me. Um, so I think there's that and, and true crime just kind of like folds right into that because it is its own sort of genre. It, it's being able to like take horror and dissect it and see it play out in the real world, which is really fascinating. and. One of the, I always, I think I told this story in the Day of Dialogue, but um, the sort of like first brush up with like real horror that I ever had was with the Blair Witch Project in 1999 when it came out. And I was so afraid of it. I was 14 or 15. And I saw it like, I don't think I saw the theater. I'd like we rented it from like Blockbuster. And I was like, oh my God, this looks like so lame. I'm not worried about this at all. And then it just completely like rocked my shit. I was so scared of it. I like stayed up every night for like weeks. I was so afraid. And then it was also like right around the time that my family got the internet. So like that whole, like the marketing campaign for that was very, very digital. It was like the first one of its kind really. And you could kind of like go to the website and like sift through the clues that were only there. Mm -hmm. And then there were so many fans that were like obsessed with it and there were forums and like, so it was both kind of an like expose to me of like real horror, like found footage, like a real proper like horror film that scared me, but also like sort of amateur detective work. And so there was such a like big abyss I was staring into, and it's all because of the Blair Witch Project. So thank you um, to the like two people who made that movie. Um, no thank you to the sequels, but you know that was <laughs> that was really formative and cool. So. Yeah, I, I think it's just kind of like, it, it's really difficult to like solve the problems in your own life a lot of the time. You're looking for, you know, a particular thread or something to help you make sense of the chaos and looking at crimes and trying to, you know, solve them yourself, trying to do your own like amateur detective work, at least gives you some semblance of like meaning and purpose and yeah, it, it just kind of helps you sort through the chaos, I would say. Yeah, it's interesting that you bring up the Blair, the Blair Witch Project. I myself was scared, totally. I think I saw that in the movie theater, but I can't imagine like seeing it in, okay. like, in, my, ho <laughs> like, in my house, you know? Um, but uh, on VHS 
you know, and my sister was like, you're like a wuss. And I was like, this is horrifying. <laughs> but, but that was like, it was, there was just so much left to your imagination. Like that was what was so scary about it. You know, it was like, you didn't see all the clues. You didn't get all the information. And I think that's why it has real like staying power too. Yeah, yeah for sure. And, you know, and, you know, horror is um, a different kind of animal um, as opposed to, to true crime. With horror, it's for the most part fiction. Um, and a, a product of uh, one's imagination. And true crime is very much based on, on fact and mm -hmm. events. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's very interesting um, because that, that particular movie was fiction, but it felt very, very real. And that's mm -hmm. why it was like so effective and so, <laughs> and so scary. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so why do you think, I mean, especially in the, climate that we're living in now, um, mm -hmm. true crime really has um, sort of taken hold of us. Um, you know, why do you think um, true crime is, is, is really, um, as a genre, popular right now? We, we have so much more access to information than we ever have. And I think a lot of, you know, old cases, like the cases that I grew up with, you know, like um, who killed John Benet Ramsey. Now we have so much more access to information. We have access to more people too who have their own sort of theories and um, sort of like their own personal explorations of these topics. But the things that like, you know, my generation, like our generation came up with, we can try to like apply all of this new information to it and even make sense of like our own sort of collective past. So I think that's really appealing. There's also such a huge camp factor in every single form of like true crime. There just is, um, you know, that sort of like really goofy documentary about Jean Benet um, that came out a couple years ago, where like the the forensic scientist like got a kid to like hit a watermelon with a hammer to like you know make sense of like would a child have been able to murder this this other child? Mm -hmm. It's so camp, like it's just so outrageous and so over the top and. I think that the line between investigation and entertainment is so blurred yes. that, you know, we kind of can't help but keep perpetuating this. And the other thing is we all are our own amateur detectives now, like with social media, you know, we have, we can kind of follow the breadcrumbs of something as it's happening, or we can go back in the past and, you know, find something that somebody said and put it in the context of whatever we want. Um, which is both a good and bad thing, obviously. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I, I think that that's why there's such an interest in true crime now, because you kind of have the ability either, you know, implicitly or if you take on a sort of action with it to be part of solving a case, even if you're just following along with it. Um, yeah, I, I think that we've kind of been like indoctrinated to these sorts of like um, investigation narratives too. Like, I don't know, just thinking about how there's so many like, you know, law, like so many versions of law and order. There's like nine, <laughs> like, right. I don't even know what all of them are. I probably love all of them, I don't know. Um, <laughs> but I think that we just, it, it's kind of part of our like DNA to, to follow things along and try to reach a logical conclusion with them. Podcasts are the same way, like true crime podcasts, yeah, I think. For sure. I, and it, it, you also have this opportunity to kind of like, apply your own um your own experiences and your own sort of like problem solving skills to things it, again I, I also think it's just another way to be like i'm deflecting whatever's going on in my life <laughs> you know like i'm not figuring out what is wrong with me necessarily i'm i'm going to solve jean benet that's what i'm going to do <laughs> <laughs> yeah no i wholly agree you know there's something like i said there's something that's just very thrilling about trying to sort of figure stuff out yourself. And, mm -hmm. you know, and certainly, you know, we have access to so many different resources and footage and everything that it's very easy. It's very easy to, to sort of, you know, try to, you know, investigate a st story further or, or something that you happen to hear about. And it's like, what, what's about that, you know? Yeah, exactly, um, exactly. 
Yeah. And one of, so, which brings me to the Papan sisters. Um, mm -hmm. I had not known who they were before I read your book. So for those in the audience who, who also don't know who the Papan mm -hmm. sisters, why don't you tell us who they were? Yes, the Papan sisters were Leah and Christine Papan. Um, Christine was the older sister by about uh, seven or eight years. Leah was the younger sister. Um, they had an older sister um, than them. Than them. Uh, Christine was actually like the, the middle child, um, but she doesn't factor into the, their crimes so much. Mm -hmm. um, but Christine and Leah were uh, hired as maids in various um, towns in the Le Mans region of France. Um, in 1926, they were hired by a family called the Lancelon family that was made up of a father, a mother, and his daughter, who was a, a late teenager. Um, the father was a retired solicitor. The mother was, you know, a housewife. Um, and they hired the sisters. And then on February 2nd, 1933, uh, Christine and Leah murdered the mother and daughter um, in a completely brutal fashion that uh, shocked the entire nation of France and beyond. And what was notable about the crime was its brutality. Um, especially notable was that uh, they gouged the eyes out of the women while they were both still alive. Um, and so that really kind of gripped, <laughs> gripped the nation. And uh, they were both um, caught shortly after. Um, they didn't try to run away. Uh, they were caught and um, put on trial. Uh, Christine was sentenced to the guillotine, uh, but she starved herself in prison. And Leia only served part of her sentence um, before she was let go. So that's the Papan sisters in a nutshell. Yeah, yeah. No, it's a, it's an incredible story, um, and also um, just how much class um, played a very big part of. Mm -hmm. um, the whole the whole crime um it, it's uh, it's really shocking um but also um you know you can kind of uh what's really interesting about the your book is that you tell it from the sister's point of view uh, so you really get um you know a sense of uh what was happening um with them and how they were treated um mm -hmm. as well um, when you were writing and uh, creating the book, Maids, um, how did you decide what parts of their story uh, to include in the book and what made the cut and what didn't make the cut? I, I wanted to um, sort of do my best to replicate, replicate a, a sort of like home life for them, um, but I didn't want to... I had to be really careful to not sway the story in a way so as to justify the crimes. That was like the number one thing that I was like, I want to be really deliberate about what background information I give about them and um, you know, just how, how much interior life I want to give them because it was like, you know, they needed to be frightening um, so in order for them to be frightening, they couldn't have too much detail, but they had to still be somewhat knowable. My, my real hope was to be able to relate to them in a way that made you uncomfortable. So, um, so that, that was really where I started. And so I decided the best place to do that would be to start um, with them getting hired in the lawn salon house uh, up until the day of the murders. Um, and, and just kind of giving it, it this like focused amount of time, I felt like really swerved away from any sort of like sentimentality about them. Um, just giving like little glimpses here and there into like, what was their family like, life like? What were their sort of mental states like um, both before and during, you know, their stay at the Lawn Salon house? Um, so yeah, I, I didn't want to give too much. Um, and so that really made chopping details out pretty easy, honestly. And they, there's not a whole lot of text on their lives before the crime. There's just some very like loose details um, because basically, you know, by the time that they, you know, had gained notoriety through these crimes, uh, they weren't really talking at that point afterwards. Um, you know, there, there was not really a whole lot of information to glean from them um, because, you know, like immediately after the murders, they were just 
uh, Christine told Leia that she was, you know, told the cops that Leia was um, deaf and dumb and she couldn't talk. And Leia immediately was like, mm, you know, like she, she just stopped talking. So there's not a lot of, um, there's not a whole lot of insight that we have into, into their particular like viewpoints or, you know, reasoning. Mm -hmm. I mean, the one thing that really, that really struck me about it is because, um, you know, they, the sisters lived with the family, um, this was a very intimate crime. I mean, this mm -hmm. was, you know, they lived in the house with this family. There was, you know, the, developing a certain trust, um, you know, with them. Um, and I think because of the way that you, that you told the story in the book, um, it makes it all the more shocking. <laughs> it makes it because it's, you know, it's these um, two women who are living in the same household. It's, it's a very communal kind of, you know, they're part mm -hmm. of this whole, you know, th this whole family really. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and I think that, um, you know, one of the things that's very effective in how the story is told is that, you know, the crime is what it is. I mean, and, and, you know, the crime kind of, you know, sort of speaks for itself, if you will, mm -hmm. <laughs> if you will. Um, yeah. Um, so you once said that you draw comics to better understand why everyday life is extraordinary. Uh, can you elaborate on, on that quote? I think that comics as a medium has so much potential beyond sort of what we we even now understand it to be able to do um the very the very first like graphic novel that i read was um mouse I, I think it was like the second volume of mouse because it was uh in my school's library so i read it when i was in sixth grade which is <laughs> very young but that was really you know beyond um sort of any of the other comics that i like enjoyed reading that was really the first time that i saw like comics has so much potential to just be, you could really tell any kind of story and you could do it in a way that is more affecting than if it was literature or film, because there's something about, you know, I don't necessarily agree with like the Scott McCloud kind of premise that like comics is the only active medium. I don't think that's necessarily true, um, but you do have to participate in it just in terms of you know, deciding for yourself how you're reading um, text versus processing images and like how, you know, you're, you're kind of like building a play in your mind almost. Yes. Um, and so just like when I started really making comics for myself, I started to, you know, appreciate things like time and gesture, inflection, uh, meaning, color, line work. There's just so many ways that you can appreciate or um, construct life using comics. And, you know, that to me now, now when I'm working, you know, it, it's not so much about like, you know, oh, lay up a pen coming after you with a big knife and it's shocking and scary. To me now it's more like, well, what were those quiet moments like when she had time with her sister, you know, when they, it was just the two of them in their room. Cause the, the only real thing that seems to be, um, like consistent throughout all of, all of these reports about their lives was that they just loved being together um, to the point of like excluding the outside world entirely. And so for me, comics is really the only way that I could have told this story because, you know, you need to have that like a different language for both of them when they're in one particular space versus in another. And like the colors change and, you know, their tones change and they, you know, the room is like the only place that they smile at each other, you know, so it, it's just kind of these like these little things that you can only do in comics that really, yeah, it, it, it does make you like kind of appreciate the little moments in your life more, I found, you know? Yeah, no, I agree. There's something that just sort of happens in your brain when you're reading images integrated with text. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, uh, I mean, reading is a very solitary um, action anyway. Um, so it's really sort of how the reader interprets whatever it is uh, that's in front of them. Mm -hmm. But there is something, you know, and the more, you know, the more you more you read uh, comics and graphic novels, there's something, 
you know, that you just sort of understand, mm -hmm. um, you know, that you are looking at something and you're reading at something. And sometimes that, you know, if it's wordless too, but there's something that, you know, even if you, you know, have a, you know, a word, wordless sequence, mm -hmm. um, it's all integrated um, into, into the whole larger narrative. Um, and, um, you know, I mean, and then there are many um, comics and graphic novels that, you know, you can't even imagine that can be told any other way, except mm -hmm. through, except through, um, you know, a graphic novel um, yeah. format. Um, I mean, maybe, you know, like you said, maybe like a stage play or something like mm -hmm. that, but um, there's something about the visual and the, the, the text um, that's something that's just, it just puts your brain onto a higher level. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Yeah. Um, one thing that I wanted to talk about, you mentioned the, the creating process of like the, the colors and the line, how it all, you know, how you, can you talk a little bit more about that? Your colors really um, stand out in, in all of your books. Um, mm -hmm. So how do you color your comics and, and what's that process like? I usually try to start with, you know, depending on what the scene is, what the mood is, I will typically kind of like associate one mood with one color and kind of build it out from there. Mm -hmm. So like I mentioned, the girls have, you know, their room on the top floor of the house. Um, and everything else in the house is, is kind of these big, like bold, um, not, not like approaching deco colors, but not, not quite that bold. It wasn't really that time yet. Um, so it's, it's sort of saturated, but it's not overwhelming. Um, but I really wanted the girls room to be stark. Um, just because it, it allowed them, it, it was the one place where they weren't like smothered, you know, by the house or by responsibilities. And so when they're in there, they typically like undress, they like take their, their uniforms off and they're like running around in slips or underwear or nothing. And so the idea there was, you know, to kind of keep that room white and like pure. And the only real colors you would get would be like from, you know, the window or from a candle. Um, yeah. And so that was a way of just kind of like stripping everything away. And that, you know, you're like, oh, white makes sense there. But then how do you do the rest of the house? So, you know, you, I wanted to apply like colors that were just going to like really disgust you. <laughs> like, you know, I, I, wanted, I wanted you to like, maybe this is my own sort of like weird personal preference, but I'm like, oh, like a green room, like, oh, it just makes me ill. And I'm like, just these big oppressive, like forest green colors that are like following you around or like, you know, the, the daughter's room was just this like salmon-y pink that you're just like, oh, this, I hate it. it. I have synesthesia, so like color is really a big, big deal for me. And like when I'm in a room that's a nasty color, I'm just like, I have to get out of here. This is disgusting, <laughs> like, ugh. Um, but yeah, but like, for example, you know, the daughter's room being this like nasty pink color, I'll start with that and then everything else will kind of build out from it. Um, and so I'll just kind of stay in a particular tone um, for the rest of, you know, that the rest of the time you're in that room, it's gonna stay that tone, um, which is, which helps like, you know, shift moods around and stuff, stuff too, so yeah. Um, with My Pretty Vampire, it was like, that had to be so over the top, you know, that had to be like big, like um, giallo, like Suspiria colors. Um, it had to be really like, you know, sanguine. It had to be over the top and heady. And yeah, I, I really wanted to get away from that. I didn't want to just, it would have been so much easier <laughs> to have had it be like made slashers, you know, and I've just run around and it's black and red and white and it's really easy to like navigate and really easy to do and this one I tried doing it a different way which you know I'm still like even personally I'm still on the fence about it I'm like I think it works you know but like I won't know until you know like five years from now when I'm like working on you know whatever else is next not five years from now five months from now <laughs> whenever I'm trying to do whatever is next like then I'll know if it if it works you know mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I hear you, I hear you. Um, so you were an art history major. Mm -hmm. 
um, how has your experience as um, a critic, an art critic and a student um, sort of uh, shape your, the work that you do? It's funny because when I'm creating, I'm not analyzing anything that I'm doing. Um, it, it's just sort of like I've had to totally divorce those two sides of my mind. Like if I try to start applying any like critical theory or thought to whatever I'm working on, it just completely takes me out of the like creative moment. So they're kind of just two like separate compartments of my brain at this mm -hmm. point, I feel like. Um, which like, I mean, I think there's something about making comics that helps me write about them. But in truth, it's just kind of like, I know the vocabularies of both of these worlds, and that helps. But I, I feel like they, everybody kind of stays in their lane <laughs> up there when I'm working, which, which is good. Um, yeah, I, I hope it continues like that. It's, it's helpful to not get too confused. But if nothing else, I mean, having studied art history, particularly like modernism between the wars, um, it did really give me a, an idea of like palette and um, tone and, you know, just sort of a better like visual sense, particularly for a, a story like this, um, of, of how things actually would have looked. Um, yeah, yeah. It, I don't know. I still don't really know. I, I just like wrote something recently and I'm, I'm still kind of like, did I do a good job at that? <laughs> what, am I, what am I doing? So yeah, it's just more perpetual confusion. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, okay. no, it's interesting <laughs> that you, that you mentioned that the, your sort of your background in art history um, sort of helps inform the art that you do, the comics that you do. Mm -hmm. um, that's very, that's very interesting. I mean, cause certainly, you know, um, and speaking as, you know, woman to woman, um, you know, in terms of representation uh, throughout art history, uh, through art in history, um, the, you know, how females are represented um, mm -hmm. uh, is certainly, uh, you know, coming and coming, <laughs> coming mm -hmm. to the fore nowadays. Yeah. Um, yeah, for sure, for sure. Or, you know, I mean, not nowadays, but, you know, it's, mm -hmm. uh, it's certainly, you know, a big issue. Uh, yeah, about true. how 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 women are represented. Mm -hmm. um, one thing um, about your books, um, including maids, um, is uh, they deal a lot with uh, female revenge mm -hmm. and um, and female rage. And um, why why do you think um, you return to those to those kinds of concepts in your books? I think it's such an enticing idea, you know, to yeah. to be able to get revenge on you know a world that has wronged you and it's so juicy and there's so much there and then every now and then like I have actually maybe not gotten revenge that sounds a little cuckoo but like I have gotten some kind of like uh like justice I guess you could say like but that's never it's never really satisfying. Um, it, the, the need for like revenge and like what you actually get out of it, like they don't fit together, <laughs> you know, like, like it's a squ like square and like a circle, like it just doesn't fit. Right. Um, and so I think that because those like, like depth are like endless, it's so easy for me to just like tap back into stories that are about that because it's really chasing like, you know, the p petite, uh, object of desire, right? Like you're never, you're never going to get it. So thinking about it is like going to be, you know, infinite. Like you can you can just do anything because it's impossible. Really, it, it's impossible to ever get what you want. And I think.
you. Um, so Maids comes out in October and, uh, and Yay.